your face. We'll just see kind of just your initials. So I've started the recording now. So welcome everybody to Remembrance Month virtual lecture series. My name is Meredith Patterson. Uh, the way this lecture series works is we will have our lecturers speak and they'll do the presentation. Uh, we ask that during the presentation uh, that you don't ask any questions just because we do have a Q&A at the end. That being said, if you have something that you just need to say, we do have a chat feature that you'll find at the top of the screen. Um, or you can also raise your hand. That's another feature that you'll see at the top of the screen. And then I'll be able to unmute you. We also ask that during the presentation you remain muted. This will just allow us to be able to better hear the pre uh, presenter and um, then we won't get any feedback. OK, so let's begin. So I'm going to present our uh, second lecture of this month. So it's Michael Petru. He is a historian of the veterans experience at the Canadian War Museum, where he is leading in their own voice, voices, an oral history project that explores how war and military services have shaped the lives of veterans and their loved ones and how those veterans in turn have shaped Canada. Petru previously worked as an editor and for co foreign correspondent reporting on war, conflict and social unrest across Europe, the Middle East and Central Asia. He was the 2018 Martin Wise Goodman Canadian Neiman Fellow at, Har at Harvard University and a Chevening Scholar at the University of Oxford, where he earned his doctorate in modern history. Petru's publications include Renegades, Canadians in the Civil, or sorry, the Spanish Civil War, and Is This Your First War? Travels Through the Post-9-11 Islamic World. And he lives in Ottawa with his family. So now I'm going to pass it over to Michael. So welcome, Michael. Thank you. Thank you, Meredith. Thanks so much for having me. And thank you all for being here. I think I, I speak on behalf of all my colleagues at the uh, at the War Museum when I say that we're so grateful for the interest that you all uh, that you all show in history and it's a real pleasure to share uh, with you a little bit of the work that we're doing. So Meredith spoke a little bit about the project that I'm working on which is which is what I want to tell you about today. It's an oral history project uh, called In Their Own Voices about the veterans experience but I think the best way that I might be able to introduce it is by asking you all a question, and that's just to take a moment and, and, and ask or answer if there's any thing that you're holding on your person right now in your wallet, in a pocket that has been there and has been on you for for years and years and years. Some of you might think of a watch that maybe was a, a gift from a loved one, a wedding ring. The object that I think of, and I, I'm not sure if you can see it that well, but it wouldn't matter if you could if we were in person because it's it's worn quite smooth. And what it is is a 1939 silver dollar. And it was given to my grandfather by his high school teacher the day that he enlisted in the Canadian Army. And he carried it with him to Camp Borden, across the Atlantic Ocean to Britain, North Africa, Sicily, all through Italy during the liberation of Holland in 1945, right through to the end of the war. And then he carried it in his pocket every day for the rest of his life. And I find this interesting because my grandfather, like so many veterans, never spoke about the war. There were the odd hints here and there in the house that it mattered to him, but it wasn't part of daily conversation. And, and unless I really pushed as a boy, I never really heard any, anything much about it. And yet clearly the war mattered a great deal to my grandfather because every day as he built a career in business, as he had children and grandchildren, and grew frail, old, and sick, right up until the day he died, he would reach into his pocket and rub this coin. And I think that speaks to the enduring influence that war and military service can have on people, even if they don't talk about it unless they're asked. And that's that's what we're trying to do with the In Their Own Voices project. As Meredith said, it's the project about the veterans experience and that means not really what happened during the war or during a, 
a veteran's time in uniform, but what happened afterwards? I never asked my grandfather, what, what do you think about when you reach into your pocket and rub that coin? But I can now ask other veterans, what do you think about on Remembrance Day? What was it like to come home after the war? What was it like to be a civilian again? And it's been a, a rich and revealing project. We've spoken to nearly 200 veterans, and, and this is crucial. We've spoken to veterans, loved ones as well, because we know that often the impacts of war and military service, those, those long ripples, touch wives and children and others close to veterans as well. So I want to introduce you to some of the the veterans that we've interviewed and, and, and get at some of the themes that we've tried to explore. And one of the first ones or one of the really impactful moments for a lot of veterans as they contemplate their their post post-war lives is what happened? How did you feel when when the war ended? So the first veteran I want to introduce you to is Alex Polowin, who unfortunately, like quite a few of the Second World War veterans I've had the pleasure to to interview over the last couple of years, has has passed away since I first spoke to him. But I asked him simply, how how did you feel when the war in Europe ended? He was a Royal Canadian Navy sailor. He had served for a number of years. He had taken part in a, a battle, or at least the, the opening phases of a battle against one of uh, Hitler's most dreaded battleships. So he survived a lot, of, a lot of difficult times in the war, and I suppose I was expecting the, the answer from Alex to be happiness, relief, but here's what he said instead. Said he was sad, and here he explains it. The sadness wasn't because the war was over. The sadness was the good times came to an end. The good times, the last ship I was on, it was it wasn't like a love boat story. You know, movie, remember remember that movie Love Love Boat, but not anything like that. But the fear of being torpedoed and all that was gone. You knew they weren't around anymore, and you knew everything was coming to an end. And when you get into Halifax, and you saw all those warships tied up with no crew on there, you know, it, it, the thought of where now, what's the rest of your life? What, what are you going to do for the rest of your life? That's very, very frightening. What am I going to do for the rest of my life? Well, the first order of business for a lot of veterans of the Second World War and the massive demobilization of service personnel that followed was, was finding a job. And one of the interesting things that's emerged from some of the, the interviews, not just with Second World War veterans, but younger ones as well, is the positive impact that service had on their civilian careers. They might have learned soft skills such as leadership. They might have learned very practical skills such as auto mechanics. For others, it was just a profound change in life trajectory. I've spoken to a number of Second World War veterans who said something like, you know, I had a grade five education. My, my life was going in this certain direction. But because of the veterans charter, I was able to go to high school, maybe even university. And this future that I didn't really have before opened up. My life changed for the better. I think that's an important thing to remember is the, the impact on just the economy on, on a grand scale, but also on individual lives in terms of their careers and their working life. But next to civilian work, the big change, I guess, to answer Alex's question, what now, what next? Well, for a lot of a lot of veterans, it was marriage. We're all, I think, familiar with a post-war baby boom and war brides. My own uncle Judd, who was 
married to my my, my granddad, who, who whose coin I not married to, sorry, was the brother of my granddad, whose whose coin I showed you. He married uh, a war bride, my great aunt Abe, who died just a couple of years ago. And I remember when I was a boy, I'd hear about their story. They met in London during the war, and it seemed very natural. And it wasn't until years later, as I got older, that I I, I pondered how little they could have known each other before Judd, along with my grandfather, headed off to oh, Sicily and then fought all up across Italy into Northwest Europe and then showed up a couple years later and off they went to Canada. It was a rupture for my great aunt, great aunt, great aunt Abe. It was a new adventure with a couple that probably didn't know each other that well. And this story was repeated Canada thousands and thousands of times. And it wasn't just relations between couples that were disrupted by war. It was relations between fathers and sons, mothers and sons. The war had a had an enormously disrupting, I think is the best the best word, or jolting. Uh, impact on thousands of of families. And that was in the Second World War, but it continues today as well. When I talk to veterans in more recent conflicts about the impact that war has had on their family, I spoke to one veteran of the Balkan Wars who lost his legs in the war and described his son being very angry that he was, in his son's eye, he was robbed of a father who could play with him, uh, play with him as a boy. So I want to introduce you to Another, uh, this is the son of a veteran of Second World War. So the son is John Reed and his father is Jonathan Reed. And, and you can see the father on the left there. Now, Jonathan was uh, a doctor in the Battle of Hong Kong. And by all accounts, he was heroic uh, during the battle and especially during the long captivity that followed. And then he came home. And you can see John there on the on the right, and he's look at the way he's leaning into his dad. And this is because the family didn't really survive intact after the war. John the elder came home. As I said, he was a hero, but he soon largely abandoned his family. And and Jonathan would only see his dad for a couple weeks in the summer at Muskoka, which is what you're seeing there. And this ripple cascaded through the many decades of, of John's life, who's tried to understand exactly how the impact of the war on his dad has shaped his own life and the life of his brother and his mother as well. And here's a little excerpt from our conversation about that. Your mother, right, when you were working on her behalf or to get pension, you said that she was as much a victim of the war as your father was. Yes. The war overtook that whole generation, those generations. I see her as a loving, devoted wife, like hundreds of thousands, whose husband went off to war, like hundreds of thousands. She wondered and hoped through the time he was away. In his case, it was such a severe, sudden, complete disastrous experience for him as a soldier that she was within several months now living in the dire fear that he wasn't alive which she didn't know for half a year and then all the time knowing he was in the dreadful circumstances he was in so i can't imagine for her how much stress and strain and worry endlessly, unceasingly, that would have been for her. And as you know from the book, she lost a child by a miscarriage sometime after he was captured. And she had to get through those years. She had to wait and wait and wait, not knowing sometimes months if he was still alive. One of my favorite 
observations about wars by the leftist German poet Bertolt Brecht, whose life was torn asunder by the, the rotten middle of the last century. And he said he who would live by war must eventually yield something in return. He who would live by war must eventually yield something in return. And again, I want to emphasize that not all veterans are broken and not all are on balance negatively affected by their service. Many speak of the hard skills, but also missing when they leave the comradeship. Something that goes deeper than comradeship. Brotherhood might be a good word, but it's it's a bond that's almost familial in its love. Uh, the American journalist Sebastian Younger uh, speaks of some of the veterans that he spent time with in the Korangal Valley of Afghanistan. And and these these guys were taking for a while more more fire than all the other outposts. The outposts in the Korangal Valley were taking more fire than all the other kind of sections of Afghanistan combined. They they lost friends, they lived in dirt, burning their poop, eating cold rations the entire time they were there. And when it was over, Younger was back in America and he invited one of the veterans of that tour to a dinner party he had. The veteran's name was Brennan and one of the women at his dinner party asked Brennan, is there anything that you miss about Afghanistan? And Brennan said, ma'am, I miss almost everything. And it was difficult, I think, for a lot of people to understand that. But I think what Brennan missed was that those bonds that arise out of a very unique circumstances of, of military service and perhaps even more so of, of conflict. So the repercussions are, are complicated, they're different, they're unique, but invariably something must be yielded in return. I want to introduce you to John Barnes. He's a long-serving Canadian uh, soldier, uh, most recently of Afghanistan and Operation Medusa, where he was wounded. He's now a veteran. Your mother. Now my priorities have changed. I have two grandkids, two grandsons, four and two. They mean the world to me. Uh, I want to be all right for them. And that's kind of what got me to really look into how I was feeling and to get that help I needed because they are important. I can go through life in my basement or I can get out of my basement and live my life to the fullest and enjoy my grandkids. And the memories are there, but they don't haunt me like they used to. Uh, I still have some nightmares every now and again, not as often, typically around a special event, something I see on TV, like Canada Day during the uh, fireworks, for example. Uh, you know, I had some nightmares that night because I had watched the fireworks. I knew I shouldn't have. It just brought back stuff. And But for the most part, I'm pretty happy where I am. My physical symptoms are still there. I wake up every day with headaches. I go to bed every day with headaches. My memory's getting worse. Uh, doctors are doing everything they can, but nothing seems to help. But my emotional baggage is certainly lessened. And uh, I've learned to to smile a bit more. So when you experience something this profound, would you think you can get a hint of that just through listening to John? After it's over, who do you who do you share it with? So one of the questions that I asked almost all the veterans that I interviewed is who do you talk about your service with? And it, it's a hard one. Um, generally we want to talk with people that that understand us and generally people that understand us have experienced something similar and that's that's a narrower narrower pool it's a smaller pool with uh with veterans um benjamin hertwig is another veteran veteran of afghanistan and and he answered that question of mine this way yeah, I, I mean, my brother was certainly someone with whom I could share things, uh, but I still, I still felt, I think, unsure of of who who to of who to speak to, and 
And I think even at that point, I was still processing to the extent that that I didn't really even want to share or want to speak with people. But I remember one occasion which has definitely remained with me, and it was a large family gathering. Um, and someone someone had mentioned something to do with Afghanistan or or someone on my tour who had died. Um, and I remember it's like crying and kind of it being a family gathering, just feeling very embarrassed of it and kind of trying to to get away from people or not um, not speak with anyone or see anyone in the house, but it was crowded and family everywhere. Um, and I remember my grandfather, uh, like a, a World War II vet, um, who who usually was sort of a very loud, domineering personality, um, not someone with whom I had sort of deep conversations, but he was uncharacteristically like quiet um, when he saw me and he kind of met me in the hallway and um, yeah, I still get emotional. Yeah, he met me in the hallway and put his arm on me. And didn't try and talk, didn't try and um, ask questions. He just said, I understand. I think the veterans experience means many things and I think describing it is an elusive goal, but but surely it includes this. Surely it includes veterans of different eras. And I should say that Benjamin's grandfather fought on the German side during the Second World War. He fought for a regime that Benjamin is repulsed by. And yet, because they shared that common experience of losing those close to them in combat, they had a bond that transcended decades of time, different generations, different wars, even different causes. I think that gets close to what we're trying to understand in this project. The veterans experience, though, isn't limited just to veterans or even their loved ones. Veterans have also changed Canada in myriad different ways. The to give one example, the Chinese Canadian veterans of the Second World War came back to a country in which they didn't enjoy full citizenship rights, but their veteranhood, their service was powerful ammunition in the post-war quest to demand a better social contract. On the other hand, many indigenous many indigenous veterans of the Second World War, to give another example, experienced far greater equality amongst their comrades, indigenous and non-indigenous, in service overseas, and then came back to a country that continued to treat them as second class. And this also acted as a certain instigator to demand change. The, the next veteran I want to show you is Blanche Bennett, another Second World War veteran who was going to talk a little, little bit a little bit about how the impact that that her service and the service of other women during the Second World War shaped Canada as well. So when born, I think we did it to prove that yeah, we could do something. And you didn't have to be wealthy, and you didn't have to be well-educated. Just did what had to be done, and you went and did it. Um, that was brought home to me again a few years ago when we flew to Ottawa, and we were asked to wear our medals, which we did. And uh, when we were getting off the aircraft, the pilot was standing at the door who happened to be a woman. And I thought, oh, my gosh, 
she has been flying this airplane. So, you know, they always talk to you, shake hands or whatever. And she said, you were in the military. And I said, yes, a long time ago. And I said, a very long time ago. And she said, my dear, she gave me such a hug. If it hadn't been for you, I wouldn't be doing this job today. And I thought, oh, my gosh, did she really say that? And the more I thought about it, I thought, yeah, she did. So I guess we did something that we should be proud of. Uh, I like to think we did. And I'd love it if everybody else thought the same. We went down the road where everybody's. What Blanche is getting at there speaks of something very important about this project and about the impact that military service has on veterans, but then the impact that those veterans in turn have on Canada. They, they've they shaped this country in profound and intimate ways. Um, Blanche Bennett is speaking about the impact that military service of women had on the role of women in society. I think that's indisputable. I think that began in the First World War and was directly tied to the enfranchisement of women in Canada. I mentioned the experience of Chinese Canadian veterans and how that shifted for the better their quest for a more just society after the war. I think all of us have driven through neighborhoods that are or direct result of the Second World War, and we probably don't even know that some of these, so many of these post-war suburbs, these generally bungalows uh, all over Toronto where I grew up and in many other cities as well, they're a direct result of the veterans' housing that came after the Second World War. So the goal of this project is to understand how military service shapes veterans, how it shapes the loved ones of veterans, and also how it shapes Canada itself. And I think that's important and has been, as I said, a rich thing to learn more about. But as a historian that's conducting these interviews, personally, time and time again, I often return to the individual stories. And I want to just close with one last one. This is Reg Harrison. He had the nickname uh, crash uh, because he survived four crashes as a pilot of a bomber in the Royal Canadian Air Force during the Second World War. And one of his very close friends during the war, his best friend during the war, was a man named Buddy Holloway. And Buddy was engaged to a woman named Jean Watts. And whenever Buddy would write a letter to Jean, he would ask Reg to so add a little a little note to the bottom. And as Buddy said, because who knows, one day after the war, you might meet her. Well, Buddy was killed in a plane crash, and Reg did meet Jean. He went home to visit her here in Ottawa. They met at the train station, and Reg married Jean. They were married for decades, and... Two or three decades later, Jean and Reg went to Britain to visit Buddy Holloway's grave. And I'd like to play you Reg describing that here. Went down the road where Buddy's grave was. And uh, I just don't know how to explain the feeling I had. And when we got to the foot of Buddy's grave, we see his name. and. I said, I remember, I didn't, I didn't say it loud enough so they could hear me, but Gene could hear me. And I said, well, buddy, Gene and I are here to say hello to you. I said, you always said that when I put a footnote on your letters that you never know, someday I might meet Gene. And I said, well, I didn't meet her. And then uh, 
I said a few more words and then I said to Gene, well, Gene, I'm going to leave you here and I'm going to go and and visit Gordon's grave. And I left Gene there. And I often wondered what her thoughts would be. It just seemed, it just seemed that things had come full circle. Yet it seemed so strange that after I said my goodbyes to him at Bournemouth and then never see him again and then standing at the foot of his headstone, it just, uh, yeah, I felt really bad. And I often wondered how Jean felt too. She never said anything. While I was talking to Buddy. But I just felt I should say something. The, uh, the veterans experience is about many things. Trauma, resilience, commemoration, memory. Sometimes it's about love. And I think Reg captures that for us in that clip. It's been a real pleasure to, to talk to you, and I, I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Is there anybody that has any questions for Michael? Martha. In just one second, someone rang my doorbell. I'm going to see who it is. Do you mind? I'll oh. be right back. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe this gives us a moment to uh, reflect on a possible question we might have for Michael. Remember, if you do have a question, you have uh, you can either there's a hand at the top, so you can select that and you can go to raise and I can unmute you or you can unmute yourself and you can feel free to ask a question. There's also there's also a chat feature as well, so you can utilize that as well. It's at the top taskbar. Um, it kind of looks like a little message icon. It says chat underneath. You could press on that and write a question in there if you'd like. I don't know so much have a question, but I have a comment. I find um, obviously hearing these experiences, like I I enjoy hearing the experiences because obviously this is not something I've experienced. So I, I like to kind of know how it's impacted people. But that being said, I also have a grandfather that served in the Second World War and he refused to talk about anything at all. Um, so sometimes it's kind of nice to hear other people's experiences because it gives me an idea of maybe how he was feeling because we never really got, you know, it was it was a subject that was never broached at all with him. Yeah, it's so I spent many years as a journalist, as, as you mentioned at the beginning. Um, and I do believe that it's a natural that we have a natural human desire to tell our stories. I think that's I mean, that's why we painted on cave walls. Right? Um, but my grandfather never spoke about the war either. And. I'm not entirely sure why. It feels different when I'm speaking with veterans as part of this project. I think the fact that I'm not related to them might help. Um, I mean, if I can maybe inject a little bit of personal content. So I spent, as I said, I spent many years as a, as a, as a journalist, including as a war correspondent. Um, you know, and some of the more difficult aspects of that, I'm probably more likely to talk about with strangers or with other with other journalists, of course, for sure. Um, but when I teach classes at the university, I might discuss that, but I don't really talk about it with my own wife or kids either. So maybe having that distance helps. Maybe having time helps. Um, maybe the fact that they've agreed to do the interview kind of breaks that barrier. Um, for whatever reason, I, I've been um, very pleased and touched by how forthcoming so many of the veterans are. 
some aren't, of course. I mean, times, sometimes you run into in, into walls, and and sometimes you can you can tell that you're hearing stories that you know the veterans have told half a dozen times, and it, it's it's just it's canned at this point. But we're also hearing, I think, some very um, revealing uh, and sometimes profound uh, revelations as well, and that, that's that's been quite special. So if somebody were to look for more information about our in our voices, where would they find this information? Yeah, we have a so some of the interviews are already posted on our our website. If you if you go to the search the collection, the Canadian War Museum, all these interviews will be part of an online exhibition. Not sorry, a selection of interview clips will be part of an online exhibition. But all the interviews will be part of our uh, permanent collection and some of them, the transcripts are posted online already. But you can learn a little bit more about the the project itself simply by Googling uh, in their own voices uh, in the Canadian War Museum. And there's a, a forum there that explains the project in a little bit more detail and even explains if you're interested in uh, in being interviewed. Um, there's a form you can fill out and, uh, and your information will get to me. Perfect. Is there anybody that before we kind of, oh, Ellen. Yes, um, I'm going to. Oh, you've already unmuted yourself. So is that OK? Perfect. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much, Michael, for a very interesting presentation. Um, my my first question, which was a non question, is how come this didn't come with a hanky warning? Um, <laughs> um, so I found it interesting. You said about how people um, having a desire to tell stories and I'm an archivist. So when people are coming in to talk to me about what they're doing, why they're needing to see records and so on, we'll get stories too. So it's coming out now about how that archivists really aren't trained to be on the receiving end of the stories, which then made me kind of wonder for you, you answered it a little bit and that for as a journalist, you talk to other journalists and, and strangers rather than family. Are you finding that with hearing some of the veteran stories that you're also needing to talk to somebody and share what you just heard? And if so, who do you talk to? And I realize that's an exceedingly personal question. Yeah, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a good question. It's a fair question. Um, Yeah, it's a very fair question. Um, I don't. Uh, perhaps I should, and I don't. Um, I suppose is is it's probably the, the honest and not perhaps <laughs> not not I'm not a good example to follow. Uh, I suppose. Um, to be to be frank. Um, and and you know, look for the most part. Um, this has been a very positive experience for for me as well. Um. But uh, yes, of course, you know, we've done 200, we've done 200 interviews. I've done 200 interviews. Um, many of them are deal with difficult content. Um, I know the camera person that's filmed maybe about 100 or 120 of them, um, you know, has raised this as well. I mean, I think it's. Uh, uh, I think it's a fair question you raise, um, you know, uh, Knock on wood. I think that it's uh, I'm I've I've been able to to handle it uh, uh, so far. Um, you know, I, I conducted many difficult interviews with people in very difficult very difficult situations as a journalist as well. Um, and I have no doubt that collectively that takes a toll. I mean, that's certainly the experience of other foreign correspondents. This all does uh, have a, have a have an a, a cumulative effect. Um, and uh, yeah, I probably should address it in a, a more direct and proactive way than I am, uh, but I'm not. So well, that, thank that, you. That, that might be too too honest. Uh, but, well, uh, no, that, that's that's but fine. Thank go. you, thank yeah, you for answering. And sometimes it's you can handle so many, and then it's that one that you wouldn't necessarily think would. I don't want to say tip you over, but the one that really hits the heart that then makes you realize that you need to talk over some of the other ones as well. Right. If I may, could I ask another question? Is that OK, uh, Meredith? Yeah, All fine. right, um, and I'm sure I could get this on the on the website too, but what's the process for people? Do people contact you about setting up an interview? How does that work? So if you go to if you just Google in their own voices in Canadian War Museum, there is a form uh, that you can fill out and that will come to me. Now I should say we, we are being. Uh, 
quite selective about whom whom we interview now. We're trying, as you can imagine, Canada being a you know a diverse bilingual country. Uh, right now, I'm, I'm being a little bit more selective about filling gaps. You know, I'd love to interview somebody from the north, for example, uh, a veteran of the Rangers or someone else from Nunavut to the Northwest Territories or Yukon. Uh, that's a gap. Uh, we've interviewed. We need to interview more francophones. That's another gap as well. Um, there are some other Rwanda until recently was a gap. So at any rate, please, I do encourage people to fill out the forms. Just uh, please don't be offended if I don't. Um, if I don't get a hold of you. So. Thank you. Well, I don't <clears throat> think we have any more questions. So on uh, on behalf of myself and the Simcoe County Museum and our guests today, I'd like to thank you, Michael, for your presentation today. It was very enlightening and it was very appreciated. So thank you for joining us today. We really do appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for having me and, and I'm, I'm sincere. I'm, I am deeply grateful for your interest as well. So thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Thanks everybody for joining us today. We will have another lecture on November 22nd. So you can feel free to check out our webpage and see what our upcoming lectures are. It's um, Dr. Brad Rudichuk, and he'll be talking about um, soldiers and news newspaper publications and letters that the soldiers sent through those publications. So thank you everybody for joining me today and I hope to see you again. Have a nice day. <laughs>